Welcome back to my channel. Let's look at the differences between the small intestine and the large intestine. I have done a lecture on the small and the large intestine. You can go and check that lecture up to keep yourself updated. Let's play around with some differences between the small intestine and the large intestine. <laughs> So looking at the structural configuration of the small intestine and the large intestine, the small intestine is divided into three subregions. We have the duodenum. This is the duodenum highlighted in red. We have the jejunum highlighted in green, and we have the ileum highlighted in black. So these are the three subregions of the small intestine. This is where we have the large intestine. The large intestine is harrowed in red here. And you see that the large intestine is configured in specific pattern, which means that they run from the cecum on the right side. We have the ascending colon here. We have the transverse colon where it runs or is directed towards the left. Then we have the continuation descending downwards. And this is the descending colon. From the descending colon, we have the sigmoid colon. We have the rectum and also the anacana. So that is how the small intestine and the large intestine have been positioned within the abdominal space. So Going to the length of the small and the large intestine, the length of the small intestine is longer than what is presented in the large intestine. So the length of the small intestine is about 6.5 meters, while the length of the large intestine is about 1.5 meters. You can see that the small intestine is quite longer than the large intestine. Also talking about the lumen, the lumen of the small intestine is less wider, while the lumen of the large intestine is more wider. The lumen of the small intestine is about 2.5 centimeter, why the lumen of the large intestine is about five centimeter, and we can see that the lumen of the large intestine is about double of what is presented in the small intestine. And this is where the name large intestine is being drafted from. It is not based on the length of the large intestine. Because if you look at the length of the large intestine, it is shorter than what is seen in the small intestine. But because the lumen of the large intestine is wider, that is the reason why it is being tagged the large intestine. So this is the lumen of the small intestine is about 2.5 centimeter. And the lumen of the large intestine here that is highlighted in red is about five centimeter. And this is where the name large intestine is being drafted from. The name is not given based on the length. Also talking about the way the small intestine and the large intestine are being positioned within the abdominal space. The small intestine is seen to be folded over itself and also the wall appears to be smooth. So if you look at it on the outside, this is the small intestine that is highlighted in blue here. You see that the small intestine is folded over itself. And if you look at the wall of the small intestine, it also appears to be smooth. This is not what is presented in the large intestine. This is the large intestine here highlighted in black. The large intestine is seen to align a specific pattern within the abdominal space. If that is why you see that the sub-regions are arranged in specific regions of the abdomen. If you look at the cecum, which is the initial segment of the large intestine, and also the ascending colon, seem to be positioned in the right side of the abdominal space. And when they get to this flexure here, which is the right colic flexure, this large intestine is seen to be directed towards the left. And at this space is where the large intestine is tagged as a transverse colon. From the transverse colon, around this flexure here, also on the left side, that is tagged the left colic flexure, it is seen to descend down as descending colon. From there, we have the S-shaped pattern or region of the large intestine, which is called the sigmoid colon. Then after which we have the rectum and also the anacana that tends to be directed towards the medial and also the posterior region down here so as to be able to attain the exit of the body, which is the anus. So you can see that the there is a specific alignment of the large intestine within the region of the abdomen. So they are not just seen to be folded over itself. They take a specific configuration within the abdominal space. Unlike the small intestine that is seen to be folded over itself. Also, if you look deeply, you see that the wall of the large intestine is not smooth as what is presented in the small intestine. If you look at the small intestine on the outside, you see that the wall is smooth. But in the large intestine, they are thrown into segmental appearance. And this occur as a result of the tinea coli that tends to run throughout the entire length of the large intestine. This is the tinea coli highlighted in green. We've tried to establish this in our previous lecture on the large intestine. 
We said that the length of the tinea coli is shorter than the length of the large intestine itself. So, and if the tinea coli needs to run through the entire length of the large intestine, it means there's going to be folding of the wall of the large intestine. And this is what leads to this baggy or segmental appearance of the large intestine on the outside. It is seen to be thrown into ostration or circulation. This ostration are the baggy or segmental appearance of the large intestine. And this is what the large intestine presents on the wall. So driving further about the mobility of the small intestine and the large intestine, the small intestine appears to be more mobile than the large intestine. And the reason behind this is the fact that the bulk of the small intestine have intraperitoneal presentation. This is the small intestine here in this region. So the bulk of the small intestine presents an intraperitoneal relation and we tried to highlight this in our previous lecture on intraperitoneal versus retroperitoneal organs. So you can also go and check that up to understand the details of intra and retroperitoneal presentation. For intraperitoneal presentation, it means that all the surfaces are covered with peritoneum. And because of that, there's going to be the formation of mesentery. It is this mesentery that is then used to connect this organ to the posterior abdominal wall. And that is what is presented in the bulk of the small intestine. And that is why they appear to be mobile. We also had that the length of the mesentery determines the grade of movement. So the longer the length of mesentery that is formed, the higher the grade of movement that the organ will be able to exhibit. So if you look at the small intestine, let's take this image to illustrate that. The region of the duodenum and also the entire regions of the jejunum and the ileum are of intraperitoneal presentation. So we can see that the bulk of the small intestine are of intraperitoneal presentation, which means that there will be the development of mesentery. And this mesentery is what will help hold these organs to the posterior abdominal wall. And this is where we have the formation of mesentery of small intestine. You can see it running to hold the small intestine to the posterior abdominal, and that is why they appear to be mobile. For the large intestine, less of the region of the large intestine are of intraperitoneal presentation when compared with the small intestine. In the large intestine, we have intraperitoneal presentation in the cecum, the transverse colon, and the sigmoid colon. The ascending and the descending colon are of retroperitoneal presentation. And this is where we have the mesentery that is developed from the transverse colon and also the sigmoid colon that are of intraperitoneal presentation. And this is where these organs are tagged or pinned to the body wall through their mesentery. So you can see that for the small intestine that has almost all its entire region of intraperitoneal presentation will be more mobile than the large intestine, which has just some of its regions that are of intraperitoneal presentation. Also going further on the details, what they do for the small intestine, more of digestion and absorption occur in the small intestine. While in the large intestine, we can say that no or less occur here, and we have absorption that are specific. So we can say no because the large intestine is not seen to contain digestive enzymes like the small intestine where we have digestive enzymes that are able to break down undigested food coming from the stomach. But in the large intestine, we do not have digestive enzymes. What we have in the large intestine are useful bacteria. And this is the useful bacterium. This is one. We have a number of them within the large intestine. And we've tried to establish what the bacteria do within the wall of the large intestine by producing vitamin K and also undergoing fermentation process. Also to add in the small intestine, we have intestinal juice. The intestinal juice also further enhance the breakdown of undigested carbohydrates or food particles. It's also used to neutralize the acidic environment that is created by the gastric juice that is produced in the stomach. The intestinal juice is produced by the epithelium lining the small intestine. In the large intestine, we do not have intestinal juice. And that is why we say that the digestion that occur within the wall of the large intestine are at minimal rates. Going further on the internal configuration, that is the mucosa wall of the small intestine and the large intestine. In the mucosa wall of the small intestine, it is thrown into circular folds also referred to plica circularis. These are infoldings that are created within the wall of the small intestine. In the large intestine, the mucosa wall is not thrown into folds. So there is no formation of circular fold within the large intestine. So this is the small intestine. If you look at the wall, it is thrown into folds. These are circular folds that are created. With this is further enhanced by villi. The villi are finger-like expression or extension seen to project into the lumen of the small intestine. 
Why in the large intestine, this is the kind of configuration that is presented, no infoldings that can be compared with the infoldings that is created within the wall of the small intestine. What these folds do basically is to increase the surface area for digestion and also absorption. We've stated in our previous slide that the bulk of digestion and also absorption occur in the small intestine. And this can be used to justify that. If you look at the internal where it is thrown into food, which is further enhanced by the villi, this will help to increase the surface area for digestion and also absorption. That is the reason why bulk or more of the digestion and absorption occur in the small intestine, because there is more space for that to occur the info this is going to be creating more space by increasing the surface area for this process to occur. While in the large intestine, there is no info this. If you cut out this region of the mucosa lining and cut out the region of the mucosa lining of the small intestine, you see that this will be longer than what is presented here. And that is why we say that there's going to be the increase of surface area for the mucosa wall that presents infoldings. So more of digestion and absorption will occur in the small intestine, while less will occur in the large intestine because there is no formation of infoldings within its mucosa wall. Coupled with the fact that there is no digestive enzymes or intestinal juice secreted within the wall of the large intestine. Also to add, we have Peyer's patches. Peyer's patches are a collection of lymph follicles, and this is what is seen in the small intestine. These are highlighted in red. These Peyer's patches are seen at the ileum, which is the terminal region of the small intestine, and they are of immune function. The Peyer's patches are not seen in the mucosa wall or lining of the large intestine. So let's go further on the blood supply. The blood supply of the small intestine and the large intestine are different. The small intestine is supplied by branches from the celiac trunk and also the superior mesenteric artery. So let's say this is the region of the duodenum that is highlighted in black here. The upper region of the duodenum is supplied by branches from the celiac trunk. This is the celiac trunk. From the celiac trunk, we have the common hepatic artery. This is the common hepatic artery that is arrowed in white. From the common hepatic artery, we have the gastroduodenal artery, which is highlighted in green. From the gastroduodenal artery, we have the superior pancreatic duodenal artery. The superior pancreatic duodenal artery gives off anterior and posterior branches that supplies the upper region of the duodenum. So you can see how we try to trace the branches down to the celiac trunk. And this is also good for us to be able to do this, to tag where the origin of these branches are coming from. So this is the superior pancreatic duodenal artery that gives off branches to supply the upper part of the duodenum. For the lower part of the duodenum, we have branches from the superior mesenteric artery. We know that the superior mesenteric artery emerges from the anterior region of the abdominal aorta that is seen below the celiac trunk. This is the celiac trunk up here. So down here, we have the superior mesenteric artery. The superior mesenteric artery will then give off the inferior pancreatic duodenal Artery, and this is the inferior pancreatic duodenal artery. This inferior pancreatic duodenal artery will then give off anterior and posterior branches to supply the lower region of the duodenum. So that is why the duodenum, which is the initial segment of the small intestine, is supplied by branches from the celiac trunk and also from the superior mesenteric artery. So talking about the second and the third region of the small intestine, which are the jejunum and also the ileum, we have jejunal and ilia branches. So this is the jejunal branch of the superior mesenteric artery, which is going to supply regions of the jejunum. And we have the ilia branch, which also emerges from the superior mesenteric artery, going to supply the ileum. So we now see that the entire small intestine is supplied by branches from the ciliac trunk and also the superior mesenteric artery. And that is how they emerge to supply the different regions of the small intestine. Then going to the large intestine, we have branches from the superior mesenteric artery and also the inferior mesenteric artery. So let's see how these branches supply the different regions of the large intestine. The large intestine, we know we, on the right side, we have the appendix, we have the cecum, we have the ascending colon, we have the right to third of the transverse colon. These regions are supplied by branches from the superior mesenteric artery. This is the superior mesenteric artery that emerges inferior 
to the ciliac trunk. As it emerges, it gives off the leucolic artery, and this is the leucolic artery. It also gives off the right colic artery, that's the right colic artery. Then it gives off the middle colic artery, that's the middle colic artery. The middle colic artery will supply the right two-third of the transverse colon. The right colic artery will supply the ascending colon, and the leucolic artery will supply the cecum, and also gives off branches to supply the appendix. So that is how we have branches from the superior mesenteric artery, supplying these subregions of the large intestine. Then the remaining regions of the large intestine is supplied by branches from the inferior mesenteric artery. So this is the inferior mesenteric artery that emerges inferior to the superior mesenteric artery. And it gives off the left colic artery, it gives off the sigmoidal arteries, then it gives off the superior rectal artery, which is highlighted in gray. The left colic artery will supply the remaining left one third of the transverse colon and also the descending colon. Sigmoidal arteries will supply the sigmoid colon. Then we have the superior rectal artery that supplies the rectum and also the superior part of the anal canal. So we can see that the large intestine is supplied by branches from the superior mesenteric artery and inferior mesenteric artery. Why the small intestine is supplied by branches from the ciliac trunk and also the superior mesenteric artery. It's also good for us to be able to establish what these branches are and how they emerge from the ciliac trunk the superior mesenteric artery and also the inferior mesenteric artery. So going further, the branches of this artery that emerge are not just saying to supply the different regions of the small intestine and large intestine directly. They undergo some form of transformation before they finally terminate into the wall to supply them with oxygen. So let's drive in into this to see how they are being transformed. For the small intestine, we have arterial arcades that are formed within the base entry of the small intestine before we have the final termination branch, which are called the straight vessels or the vasa recta. So we said that we have the emergence of the jejuna and the iliac arteries, which emerges from the superior mesenteric artery. These are highlighted in yellow. And as they emerge, they are not seen to directly supply the wall of the jejunum and the ileum. They are seen to present a form of hack like anastomosis. And these are called arterial arcades. This is what is presented here. This hack like anastomosis or connecting network of vessels are created by the ilia artery, which emerges from the superior mesenteric artery. And this artery goes and it forms this hack like anastomosis, which are called arterial arcades. And this finally gives off straight branches. And these are the straight branches. These are called the vasa recta. It is this vasa recta that finally terminates onto the wall of the ileum that then supplies this region with oxygen and nutrients. This kind of presentation is also presented or expressed within the jejunal artery. And this is what is presented or highlighted here in green. So this is the kind of configuration that is seen within the small intestine after the emergence of the branches that supply the small intestine. But the large intestine, it undergoes another form of transformation. So we have the marginal arteries. These marginal arteries are circular anastomoses that are created by branches from the superior and the inferior mesenteric artery that are going to supply the different regions of the large intestine. So as they also emerge, they are not seen to directly supply the wall of the large intestine. They undergo a circular anastomosis, which are called the marginal arteries. So this is the marginal artery created here. After this circular configuration, we then have the emergence of the straight vessels, and these are called the vasa recta. So these straight vessels are what go directly to supply the wall of the large intestine. So you can see that as these vessels emerge, they are not seen to directly go to the wall of the large intestine to supply them with oxygen and nutrients. And this, of course, is different from what is presented in the small intestine, where they are seen to undergo a like configuration that's called arterial arcades before they finally terminate as straight vessels. So talking about developmental process, the development of the small intestine and the large intestine are from different regions of the gut. For small intestine, the small intestine develops from the foregut and the mid gut, while the large intestine develops from the mid gut and the hind gut. So we can see that the small intestine and the large intestine are developed from different regions of the gut during developmental process. Also, when we try to highlight the formation of ostration within the world of the large intestine, and we 
talk about tinea coli running through the entire length or surface of the large intestine that leads to the formation of ostration. On both sides of the tinea coli, we have fatty tags that are called epiplic appendages. These are the epiplic appendages highlighted in red. These epiplic appendages or fatty tags are not seen on the wall of the small intestine. Feel free to add to the differences between the small intestine and also large intestine. I'll be looking forward to this in the comment section. Thanks for watching. Let's meet again.